Hey, Dalton. How you doing, man? Hey, man. I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for going on the podcast with me. Absolutely. It's going to be a good time. Yeah. So um, Dalton is a levy wand expert, and a lot of people might not know what a levy wand is. Would you kind of... How, how would you describe what a levy wand is? <laughs> um, a, a magical floating stick. Magical floating stick. That's... Yeah. That That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Um, it kind of, uh, it basically looks like a long pole or a wand that's suspended, uh, vertically up in the air. And then there's an invisible string that's attached somewhere around the middle. And it's actually a really precise point. Correct. And then the wand, uh, just kind of seems to float around your body, almost like, almost like liquid and very soft movements, almost like it's weightless and lighter than air, right? Sure. Depending on, depending on your style, I guess. Okay. And, um, uh, it's often like, I think the other one started off as like a little kid's toy, like a little <laughs> simple, you know, toys back in the day and well, stuff. Well, actually it has a fairly interesting history. Um, as like a lot of flow arts have sort of started off as like weapons or we've heard of like the Ma- Maori people that mm-hmm. started poi. Um, and Levy Wand has sort of a different story. Levy Wand started as a magic trick. Um, it was popularized in the United States by David Copperfield in the late sixties. And essentially it was the dancing cane magic trick. So he would walk out, um, like, I don't know, like he's paralyzed or like not quite paralyzed, but you know, needed assistance, Mm -hmm. um, with this cane. And then, um, all of a sudden the music would start and the cane would levitate and he'd dance around with it. And since then, it's sort of become this whole, like, thing where um, we have, like, tricks and we have long string and short string and tosses and, like, this whole, like, plethora of, you know, ideas that are coming out of it that uh, were originally just a a floating stick. Or a cane, specifically. A cane, a floating cane, exactly. So it was the the original was the levy cane. (laughs) The levy cane, yes, exactly. (laughs) <laughs> wow, I didn't know that at all. That's, that's pretty incredible. That makes a lot of sense because um, I know my first exposure to seeing a levy wand was um, actually here in Austin at Esther Follies. Hmm. There's a magician who did a levy wand set, and there they uh, they had the dark, the lights all down dark, so you couldn't see the string at all. And uh, I didn't know what I was was about to see, so I actually was like, "How is he floating that?" For sure, yeah. And I think like all the people who have sort of picked up levy wand, at least as their main prop. Um, I've sort of had that moment, you know, where you see someone using it and you're just totally flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. Like, what is even happening here? I know that's what it was like for me. And, you know, the the next day I bought one and it's just been history ever since. Mm Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I feel embarrassed to call it a kid's toy because I've just seen the little inexpensive five and ten dollar ones, and the ones at fair where people are just selling them, almost like uh, like an old uh, toy from the day. But um, when you say you've bought one, you obviously have gotten one that's a lot more professional and has a lot more design inside. Of it. <laughs> My first one was a, a silver stick on a string. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like as basic as it gets. Um, there was a a lady that had one the, the day after that I saw it for the first time, and. I was, I, I recognized it immediately. I was like, that's the thing that I saw last night. So I ran up to her and I was like, where did you get this? Are they selling them here? And she said, no, they're not selling them here. It's called a levy wand, but I'll give you mine for 20 bucks. I was like, yes, please. And thank you. <laughs> Handed her 20 bucks and spent the rest of the festival with it attached to my hand. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So you're just instantly hooked. Instantly. Yeah. Had you uh, spun any other flow props? Never or? before. I didn't even know like what it was. I, that was my first introduction to flow arts. And, um, really it's, it's a weird introduction too, because like for a while, Levy Wand wasn't even considered a flow art, you know, like it, it wasn't sort of respected along the same lines as like staff or poi or, you know, all these other things that have a lot more of a technical history with them. Levy Wand, was a magic trick, mm-hmm. you know? And so people sort of saw it as a gimmick. And which, I mean, I, I enjoyed it for that. Like, I'm sort of a fan of gimmicky things. I like big fire and flashy lights and, mm. you know, all the things that just make people say, wow, you know? Um, but for for Levy Wand, it's sort of, I was kind of, I got in at this time where it wasn't respected as a flow art. And then I got to watch it grow and slowly be more accepted um in the flow arts community which has been really cool Mm -hmm. and i mean i've I've definitely seen that firsthand uh i think in 2017 was the first time i met you and you were uh performing in the uh, flow arts flow case at 
um, Flowstorm in uh, Austin, Texas, for one of their events. And that was pretty wild because um, there were a number of performers doing all kind of fire performances, but you were the only one who did an LED set with a flow wand that <laughs> night. And we had, uh, I remember just the different color lights on you, and that was actually a really captivating performance, and it just kind of broke up all this intense fire energy with this really elegant, magical piece that just came in. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, um, I've, I've sort of regularly been the one to, to bring an LED set to a mostly fire show. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, I just, I don't know. I, I'm just a fan of, uh, of technology a lot. And especially whenever it comes to performances, I find that technology can sometimes be more predictable for me than fire can be. And as much as I love fire, um, I've done fire performances and it's great and it's exciting and all that. But I feel like I can sort of push my bounds more with LED than I can with fire. And so I sort of uh, default to that a lot of the times um, for my performances. Mm -hmm. And it's done me well. I mean, it's um, the last one that I did was at uh, Fire Drums out in California. And um, that one was really great. I think I was one of, I, I was actually the only one that did LED there too, I think. And um it was great because they had me like right between like the circusy day acts, you know, and then they had my act, which was LED, and then they had all the fire acts. And so I was sort of like the bridge between the two. And that one was really fun because I got to um, show off my, my Pyrotera wands, which are super great. Um, I love those things. They're amazing. Um, and I was doing this act that I call Visionary. Mm -hmm. And so that act is basically... Um, like I'm not calling my act visionary. I, I want that. I want to get that straight first of all. I feel like that's something someone else has to say about you. You can't say that about yourself, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but I, I was. I took art from some visionary artists that I've followed. You know, throughout my entire career in this from day one. Um, be before this, I I was really into just visual art. You know, I I did some illustration stuff. I did a lot of drawing, um, and so being able to follow these, um, this whole different community that's sort of a subculture within, that, that's like a, like a sister culture to ours, you know, coming up in the same sort of festival scene, um, psychedelic communities, sort of all that stuff. Um, being able to grow up with that and then sort of um, take their art and include it in my show by uploading it to my Pyrotera wands and performing with it, um, it sort of added this whole new dimension to... Um, my performance that has been really sort of, um, I don't know, I guess that's all I can really say about it is it's a whole new dimension. And um, that that performance was really special for me. And it turned out it was special for a lot of people too. So it was really good. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, do you have a recording of that special somewhere? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, Nowhere. Yeah. Not even some Instagram clips? Or um, no, know? I didn't think to ask anybody. So... I spent the entire drive there and then most of the event as well, just sitting in my car, working on the the patterns and like sequencing the lights and making sure that everything was exactly lined up with the music. Um, it was like tons and tons of hours that went into it along with costuming and I like 3D printed a mask that, that went with it and like all this stuff. But I didn't expect it to have the... Um, the, the amount of time that it that it required was just way more than I expected. And so I ended up spending most of the event on this. And then like I was super like stressed out right before it because I was trying to get everything together and like working properly. And then I just forgot to ask anybody to film and they didn't have someone there doing it for the event. So yeah, it <laughs> happened and it's transient and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you've also, um, you're a specialist with LED for sure, but I know you've also used a variety of different types of levy wands and different uh, materials and even mediums, you could say. Um, if anyone takes a look at some of your, your work and your highlights, you have a lot of work with, um, looks like, smoke effects and pyrotechnics on uh, levy wands. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah, those are great. Um, yeah, so that started, I guess that's about three years ago now, um, was whenever I first started uh, building that concept. And 
it started out as a staff. Um, and, and in fact, I still have it. I just moved out of my house the other day and I found it. I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's the history, prototype, huh? right? Yeah. yeah. Prototype number one. And it's funny because it's just like, it's just like some PVC ends that we connected to a wooden shaft that's like way too thick to be usable for any kind of staff work. Mm-hmm. And like we had to like heat up the PVC so that we could expand it out to fit the grenades in. And like we have this like clip thing that's barely hanging on that's super dangerous mm-hmm. to use if we were ever going to use it again. S- smoke grenades, not actual grenades. Right. <laughs> smoke grenades. Right. Yeah. We are not. That'd be very dangerous. They're way dangerous. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit of fun, but. Well, that's why you need a long string. Keep it. <laughs> right. Keep it safe. <laughs> Minimal it safety it distance. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, the, the smoke is great. Um, I was originally inspired by this guy named uh, Butch Loxon. He operates out in L.A., And um, I guess everywhere kind of now he does a lot of traveling, but um, I guess I was, it was him and like a few random pictures that I came across on the internet of people basically just waving these things, these smoke grenades around, you know, and I would notice that as they waved them around that they would leave these trails that sort of lingered for a little bit. And um, like our art form, as a performance artist, you sort of have to like um, reckon with this transience like this ultimate like passing of your art you know like um it's there for less than a moment and then it's gone like completely unless you video it and then even videos like are still not like what it was in real life you know and so whenever i saw like how the smoke sort of lingered there how it you you could make a pattern and it stayed for for just a hair longer um that was really inspiring for me to to then like go and try to make it into a prop that I could use and maybe make the the art a little bit more permanent, mm-hmm. you know. And so um, it started with a staff that we just sort of threw together. Um, me and my friend uh, R J. He goes by he goes by Roland Ray. Um, he's the guy who started Roland Sticks. If you guys had ever heard of that. Um, they, they still make contact staffs, but we've sort of taken a break on the smoke props for a while for various reasons. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, him and I sort of just got together in his workshop one day, and I was like, look, man, let's take one of these smoke grenades and stick it on a prop. And he said, okay, let's do it. So we made a staff. It worked. Um, we took a video. We went down to Houston. Uh, they have this beautiful graffiti museum down there that we, that we took a video in front of. And, you know, it's, like, super rudimentary. We don't know anything about how this stuff actually functions. We sort of just, like, stuck some grenades in it, pulled the pins, and wished for the best, you know? And that's sort of just how you have to do it sometimes. So I was fine with that. Um, And, like, inevitably, you know, like, nothing really worked. (laughs) And we got a few good clips out of it, but a lot of it was, like, um, just really big clouds that would gather around me. And, like, after looking through, like, like, uh, content from, like, butch or from you know various other people that have done smoke photography um it was always so clean looking and like you could see their face and they weren't engulfed in this mucky cloud of like various colors mixed together it didn't disperse it like right they have the clouds like kind of stay together a lot longer absolutely yeah and so um so I was like, I messaged uh, Butch Loxon actually and um like asked him like how do you how do you do this like w- what's the key here and he told me to just pay attention to the wind and so um wind is like the the secret mechanism behind all of these beautiful smoke shots like whenever um you have no wind it clouds up around you but if you have a good amount of wind in one solid direction and you have like the camera upstream from the wind so that the smoke is blowing away from the camera oh man it's like it's like perfect. And so that's what I started doing. And then we ended up making wands and we made poi and we made rope darts and staffs all like, um, after numerous like attempts and failures and changes of, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. construction. And then we like got pre-orders and then all of our stuff broke. (laughs) And then RJ got like hit by a drunk driver and then like (laughs) he had nerve damage so he couldn't make props anymore. And uh, it, it was just, so many things happened that were totally against us. But um, just recently, I made the the first batch of smoke poi and rope darts for since like last year sometime. Mm-hmm. And so 
we're slowly getting back to it, <laughs> which is nice because I don't want this technology to just go to waste. Yeah, definitely not. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Like, it's so simple to come up with an idea and a product. Like, that's like, <laughs> I mean, arguably people say it's the hardest part, but really that's the easiest part. The hard part then comes distributing it, selling it, <laughs> mass producing it, getting out the door. Like, you suddenly have this whole business side that you have to learn for the first time. And really you're just... I just want to make this thing and share it with people. <laughs> right. And it's it's sometimes so difficult just to even get things in people's hands. Yeah, for sure. Um, I like R&D. That's my department. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just yeah. build things and then like other people figure that part out. Um, that's not my expertise. There's some people who are really good at that and props to them. Because, <laughs> props to them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because, you know, I can't do that. But yeah, so that was that was our big issue is we just couldn't really get them out. And so, you know, that's fine. Um but now we're sort of getting back to it. And like next on the list is going to be dragon staffs. Mm-hmm. So we're going to make some really cool dragon staffs that like funnel the smoke out in three different directions on each end. Oh, so wow. you're like spinning it and it's like making these spirals of smoke. Um, that and then hoops are just going to have to happen. <laughs> I'm really excited for it. Don't get me wrong. But also making hoops is not something that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Maybe I'll just make some quick wicks or something, some smoke equivalent of quick wicks. Very cool. <laughs> well, next time you're having one of your smoke parties, you need a dragon <laughs> staff, right? I'd love to play with that thing. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, we're going to definitely have a, a smoke party at some point. That'd Very be good. cool. So um, last year, you and me actually got to attend uh, Burning Man um, together with a uh, Fire Conclave Pyrocon- Pyrotex. Um, that was pretty uh, excellent. And I remember um, you brought a prop that um, I hadn't actually seen performed live before, which was a full fire levy wand. Yes. And I remember you doing that in front of the Cobra bus out there. Yes. Um, so a full fire levy wand doesn't just have the fire at just the top and bottom tips. It's the entire rod that's on fire. Absolutely. And um, I guess you can't use a normal string <laughs> whenever you use that, huh? Not quite. <laughs> yeah. So there's a... Um it's it's built generally the same way. Um, the main difference is obviously the wicking, and then the um, instead of a string connecting straight to the shaft, uh, there is a a thin steel cable that uh, wraps through that hole and then um, is pinched off about a foot from that hole, and then you connect the string to that steel cable. So. Um, it won't burn through, which is really cool, but it also has sort of this side effect of just getting insanely hot throughout the burn. Mm. And so, um, I've had, you know, some mishaps with that before. Like there was once where I was, um, was performing with it and I did some sort of palm spin that I usually do with my other wands and it works out fine, but it ended up wrapping that steel cable around my wrist and it just seared into my wrist the whole, and I just I had to let go of it immediately, but like it was... It was a lot. <laughs> I didn't even recognize the pain until afterwards, and I was like, "Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hold off. I'm gonna finish the performance, and then I'm gonna look at it." <laughs> and it was bad, <laughs> but I survived, and I'm better now because of it. So, a lot of the, um, a lot of the worst burns tend to come from the metal that's on the props than from the fire itself. Absolutely, yeah. Fire's your friend. Metal is not. <laughs> <laughs> Metal's trying to hit you in the head. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great wand, though. Um, it's made by this guy named uh, Leica. Um, he he ran a shop called Leica on Fire, and um, <laughs> <laughs> right, that is excellent. <laughs> it's a great. I mean, but his work was fantastic. Like it was absolutely amazing. I still use like my main fire wands. Um, they're these beautiful um, wands with six wicks on them. So there's three on each end, mm-hmm. and I have a set of two of them. And those are my main wands. I use them for just about every wand burn that I do now because there's just no beating them. And the amount of fire is like the maximum amount of fire you can have while still being able to do contact stuff, which you sort of need some Mm -hmm. exposed shaft for. And so it's great for that. Um, You know, looks amazing because a six wick wand, like who has that, you know? And it's, it's just all around great craftsmanship. And I... It, I'm sorry to say, but like he, he closed down shop. I don't know why. I think he just sort of decided to go a different direction in life, which is fair. But I also wish he would still make wands because mm. they're amazing. 
You know, it's funny because just the other day I was having to make a levy one for a, a friend. Uh, shout out to Takuma. Um, <laughs> What's up, Takuma? What's up? <laughs> um, and he, he referenced your six-wick wand quite a bit. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to rip off Dalton's wand. <laughs> so we ended up making him a uh, four-wick wand uh, that cool. was a little thicker. And we kind of put it right to the limit of how much fire we can get on that thing. Nice. Um, one thing that like I didn't uh, realize, and um, I guess I should have, but how much it really affected it was... As that prop burns, it drastically changes the balance on it. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that fuel weight is a thing, like a big thing. Um, One thing that we sort of figured out in the wand community is that if you um, dip the top wick first and then the bottom wick and then light the top wick first and then the bottom wick, um, then you sort of have the advantage of more of the fuel evaporating and or burning off on the top than the bottom, and it will stay balanced better Mm. throughout the burn. So you just have a slight more weight on the bottom than on the top. Absolutely. That's actually a really good tip. That makes sense. It helps. Everything on a levy wand, when they're made proper, is uh, they tend to have either just more um, wand on the base, or they have some type of weight or counterweight drilled into the bottom that just makes the base a lot heavy. And when that uh, center point's drilled just right, it kind of locks in there. And from uh, what I read online is um, the the center point on a levy wand, it's normally... um, anywhere from an inch to half an inch to a quarter of an inch off of the center point with the uh, the heavy end pointed downward. Mm-hmm. And they say that um, the shorter that range gets, like if you're at a quarter inch, that tends to be where uh, people who are a lot more skilled or more professional tend to float their wands. <laughs> yeah, so mine are at, um, the ones that I make are at six millimeters off center. Nice. So metric system. Metric. <laughs> I'm I'm a physicist, man. <laughs> like <laughs> standard is is for chumps. <laughs> that's true. You are so. Um, that's something people might not know about you. Um, <laughs> you got your college degree recently in quantum physics. Yeah, yeah. So I just graduated with my uh, master of science in particle physics um, last December. Yeah. So I've been out of school for about going on like six months now, seven months. And it's been great. I love not being in school. <laughs> Although my life tends to be exactly the same with the amount of workload and the stress and all that. Like, just not having that rigidity is kind of nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so are you uh, going to be uh, building bombs or pursuing uh, <laughs> a career in, you know, subatomic particles? <laughs> um, I will not build bombs for anybody. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, well, I mean, it's... Like, it's a consideration to take because, like, I started off engineering. I, I was going to do aerospace engineering. And because um, I love planes. I like flight. Um, it's it's just a fascinating concept for me. Um, but I realized very quickly in that program that most of the people who graduated in it would go work for, like, Lockheed Martin or, you know, the Department of Defense. And, like, I just I didn't want to build weapons, you know? And so um, I just I just couldn't handle that morally. So I decided to go to physics because physics, even though if it is used for weapons, eventually it will be a long time before then. And I have like um, plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> so I was fine with that. Um, now, um, uh, I assume just much like anything you learn in this life, um, your knowledge of physics, they probably played a, a bit of a key role in some of your flow art. Oh, for sure. Yeah. From the way that I, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, from the way that I explain things in my classes to actually building props, um, like being able to like figure out some of the, the chemistry behind fire as well. Like, even though I did go to school for physics, I sort of had to have this, um, wealth of knowledge about, uh, a lot of sciences, uh, chemistry included. And so I've been playing a lot with like, um, you know, your colored flames and Mm -hmm. sparkle effects and pyrotechnics even. Like it all sort of falls under the same category. Um, But for teaching especially, I I found that whenever I explain things like very, I guess, logically, categorically maybe, Mm -hmm. um, then it tends to sort of like trigger this moment of recognition for people where it's it's less about like yeah just do this and it's more about like if you do it this way this will happen and it will cause this you know it's a very like cause and effect relationship which 
is sort of the, um, you know, the, the foundation of a lot of sciences. It's that, that way of thinking logically so that you get the desired outcome from a controlled input, you know. And so that's how I sort of explain things to people. And it seems to work a lot of the time. So that's good. Um, and also like prop making, right? Because prop making is all physics. Like that's all just like, especially levy wands, as we just talked mm -hmm. about, right? Like finding that balance point is is a lot, <laughs> you know? Like sometimes it can just be really stressful whenever you have, you, there's all these variables that are changing and you just have to be able to like figure it out so it just works. And whenever I was building smoke props, especially smoke levy wands, like that was a lot of science to go into that because um, not only do you have, you know, the standard, like you have to drill it this far above the center so that it stays balanced, but we have moving parts on it, like the caps on the chambers would have to come off so you can fit a smoke grenade in it. We have the smoke grenades themselves, um, which are not a standard weight. So the weight varies depending mm. on what smoke grenade you use, as well as whenever the smoke grenades are triggered, they lose mass as as they spew, you know? Mm -hmm. And so not only do they lose mass, but they lose mass... Um, rapidly. Rapidly and um, not, like, in a standard way. Like, it, it, the the yellow one lose ma loses mass quicker than, like, the black one. Oh, instance. so the mixing colors even brought challenges. Right, yeah. So, like, because each color is a different chemical composition, mm -hmm. you know? So... Um, like having to deal with all of these different variables just to have a, a, a well-balanced wand because, you know, I'm a wander. I can't sell a wand that's not balanced, you know, and it, that's, that's a pet peeve of mine too. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to like call people out but, and there's some amazing wand makers out there too. So don't get me wrong. There's some great people, but I've definitely bought wands before that are not balanced. I'm like, how, are, how, how do I use this? I can't even use this much less, you know, enjoy it. And so I had to come out with a smoke wand that was well balanced and made the correct effect. And that was just a lot of scientific input for that. Were you able to make one wand or did you have to make different models for different colors and different you know settings of so uh, the effects? We came out with a standard wand that worked with all of them. I was That's like my crowning achievement. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they are no longer available. <laughs> they are no longer, exactly. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's hoping they can Google search wand for sale, right? Now. You're going to well, have to email Dalton. <laughs> yeah, beg me for it. it. <laughs> no, but we're going to start making them again um, whenever I get uh, back to the States next year. And so I'll be... Um, I only started making poi and rope dart again, sort of because they require the least engineering and the least effort. Um and I needed to pay rent. <laughs> and so that's what happened there. And so I started off with those, and it's going great. Like, it's working amazingly. The, all of them look beautiful. Um, and so I'm thinking, like, once I get back, I'm going to start going ham on, mm. on wands and staffs again, too. Now, you say once you get back. I yes. think that's because we haven't talked about um, some exciting news as to why you're packing up and leaving Austin. Yes. It's because uh, you just kind of got discovered recently for all this flow lawn work. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, I, so I'm doing a um, six-month contract with Cirque du Soleil. Woo. Um, woo. Yeah, exactly. It's the dream. Um, literally, it, it is mm -hmm. the dream for, for a while now, which is super cool. You got your you got your masters in physics and you're ready to go join the circus. <laughs> right. It's wonderful. <laughs> I ditched a job in STEM for circus performance. I'm full of great ideas, I promise. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, um you needed the challenge, right? <laughs> That's what you it got, was. You already mastered physics. <laughs> You're not a flow on master yet, I guess. I don't it's see true. that certificate. Yeah, I don't have a certificate for that. So you're you're on the money there. I need someone someone that can issue me a certificate for yes, that first. If so only can... we had some type of flow institute or <laughs> right. prop master certificate. <laughs> that would be great. I don't know, it might get pompous pretty quick now. It certainly. Like it is guaranteed that it gets pompous mm -hmm. pretty quick. I have this flow on masters and graduated <laughs> and I can't find a job anywhere. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> I just have to continue stating that I'm a flow on master until someone believes me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um yeah, so the Cirque du Soleil thing is gonna be really cool. It's um 
I get to go train for two weeks at their circus facility in Montreal, which is going to be super cool. I've never actually taken um, professional circus training before, and so that's going to be a first for me, and I'm really hoping that they really just sort of like smack me into place mm -hmm. because I need it, man. I need it. Are they just going to – is this a general like – here's how you do circus type training, or is it going to be focused on the acts that you're going to be performing for them? So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I'm going to have a general sort of circus education as much as you can get in two weeks, I guess. Um, but also it is specifically for these two shows that I'm going to be in. And so I need to, um, you know, have specific instruction on maybe not how to spin levy wand because I, I think I'm sort of more qualified to teach that than they are at this point. But, um, I mean, I've, I've been doing it for a long time, and it's a new prop. It's it's whatever. They are they are bringing you on board for sure. They are, yeah. <laughs> um, but they are going to teach me, like, really important things like, you know, showmanship and presentation and how to function on stage and, like, point my toes and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> which I do anyway. Yeah. I will be clear about that. But you to work on those pirouettes. <laughs> right. Honestly, though, like that, that's the kind of stuff that I feel like they're really going to hammer it, hammer in, you know, because like I need to be mm -hmm. circus level good. And um, are you allowed to talk about what kind of show you're going to be performing? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there are two shows. One is called uh, Saima and the other one is called Virilia. Um, one of them is a show. Oh, gosh. You're really testing me at this point. Um, one of them is a show about a, I think it's a sailor who gets lost at sea and lands in some, uh, like like a magical island, I think, and basically happens across all these, um, you know, whimsical creatures and sort of um, imaginative people doing crazy things and, you know, input various circus arts, you know, because um, they're basically superpowers for, for real human beings. <laughs> and um, I think I'm going to be, oh gosh, I forgot what my character is going to be called, but it's basically this um, like mysterious sort of uh, being who, um, you know, pops out of this like um, pyramid thing. And I'm Are just, you one of the creatures on the island? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to have this... Um, you know, a levy wand act that I think is going to start with a single levy wand and then end, uh, or at least pick up a second levy wand halfway through. Um, and so it's going to start as a single levy wand act and end as a double levy wand act. And it's going to be pretty cool. I mean, <laughs> I'm really excited for it. And then the second show, I'm just going to be like an extra. I'm going to be like a jogger or something that just sort of runs through and creates a scene. So that'll be fun too. That sounds wonderful. And um, you're going to be performing this on a cruise ship, right? Yes, yeah. So it's going to be on board the MSC Bellissima. Um, so anyone who takes a cruise on that ship will see my show if you come by. And there's something special about that ship. This is almost, this like year, 2019, is the year of its first voyage. You were Absolutely, me. yeah. Maiden Voyage was March of 2019. And so um, Cirque du Soleil collaborated with MSC Cruises to build this ship. And so they have a very specially outfitted stage, especially for um, the Cirque du Soleil show. And so it's going to be ideal, to say the least. Wonderful. And um, what part of the world are you going to be? Oh, man. Um, yeah, so it's going to be um, the first half. It, it's a six-month contract. And so the first three months are going to be Spain, Italy, and France, and a small island off of Italy called uh, Malta. Um, and then the last three months are going to be in the Middle East region. So Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, uh, Bahrain, and a few other places. Um, so just generally in the Mediterranean Sea. That is really cool, Elton. It's going to be fun. I would, uh, I'd love it if, uh, when you get done with the six month, uh, amazing tour, if you'd come back and do another interview, we can uh, <laughs> talk about what your experience was like. That would be great. I'd love that. That'd be really cool. Um, so if, uh, if anybody's thinking about taking a cruise in Spain recently, <laughs> what would they need to look up to, to get on that boat to see one of your acts? Yeah. Do you know, what would they, how would uh, people feel to find that? I'll be able to find it. So, um, it's just anyone who takes a trip on the MSC Bellissima, um, that will be on there doing two shows a day, six days a week. All right. So if you want to see Dalton and his magical levy ones, 
and being a creature of the islands. <laughs> that sounds pretty awesome. Um, well, Dalton, um, thanks for being a guest here on All Things Fire. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, if people want to follow you, uh, where would they be able to find you? You got any social media plugs? Yeah, yeah. So um, you can always just friend me on Facebook. It's Dalton Sesums. Um, also, I have an Instagram. Uh, my username is Clear Human Eyes. And then I have a YouTube channel that's just youtube.com slash Dalton Sesums. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah. You can find me on any of the three networks. Awesome. Very cool. I look forward to seeing what you're going to be doing on your uh, traveling around the world <laughs> adventure. <laughs> me too. <laughs> If you want to support the All Things Fire podcast, head on over to patreon.com and search for Morgan Floki. Thank you for all your support, travelers. Have a great day.